Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gospel Tech Podcast. My name is Nathan Sutherland, and this podcast is dedicated to helping families love God and use tech. Today, we are continuing our conversation on analog adventures, and we are looking at two new types, two new categories of analog adventures. Uh, Category number one is going to be how can we play well or play something? And the second is how can we make something or make something well using our creative skills God has given us. Uh, The point of this conversation is to look at analog adventures, our non-digital fun, and how we can train ourselves, model for our kids, and even raise our kids into a way of enjoying real life at the pace of real life, enjoying the skills and abilities God has given them uh, so that our children, yes, know the wonder of the amazingly well-designed digital outlets they have, their shows, their games, uh, the different tablets and devices they have access to, and they know how to make their own fun. They know how to engage uh, others. And as we'll see today, uh, specifically board games is the type of game we're going to talk about. We'll talk about sports next week. But the type of game we're going to talk about is an organized, uh, well-designed game that our children can learn from and engage with, and then how can they actually be creative and make their own. So that's the goal of today's conversation. To the end of today, you are going to know both uh, some reasons why it's valuable to do, and you can begin immediately in implementing some of this in your own family. So with no further ado, let's get this conversation started. Thank you to everyone who's helped make this podcast possible. Thank you for listening, for sharing, for liking. Uh, Thank you for rating and reviewing. That little one-sentence review you give us lets other people know why you like it. Uh, And the five-star rating allows people to find it when they go searching for resources or it even just pops up. I've talked to people who are like, oh, I found your podcast because it popped up in my feed. They'd heard of me before, but they didn't listen to it until it showed up and my face was there on the little podcast cover. That's why you're helping us do this. So thanks for doing that. Uh, today's conversation is Analog Adventures Part 2. How can we make something and, or excuse me, it's going to go in reverse. We're going to play something and make something. And uh, as, if you've listened to this podcast at all, you know that playing something is near and dear to my heart. Uh, yes, because I was a middle school teacher, but primarily because I'm the father of three humans. Uh, Anna and I love seeing our kids play well if it's organized sports, if it's with one another, if it's something like a board game. Uh, and I personally am a huge fan of board games. Uh, if you don't know my testimony at all, the quick little uh, sound bite of it would be 12 years ago, I played my last video game after playing video games since I was eight. So 20 20 years in, the Lord convicted me that I was using my video games for fun, or excuse me, for hope, not for fun. I wasn't playing video games because I had hope. I was using them for hope. And I had to set them aside because the Lord asked me to trust him. It's been beautiful. And board games are something I've been able to pick up. Not every board game. There are certainly board games that tickle an unhealthy part of my, uh, I would say, intense personality that has a hard time walking away from things. But a vast majority of board games can be awesome. Uh, So let's dive in. First, why analog adventures? Uh, There's lots of reasons why we're working on analog adventures. But the first might be, uh, this isn't in sequential order of like priority. Uh, It's just a list. So don't think the number one is like the most important. But slower pace of play does matter. Because it's not, you're not being engaged just by the rapidity of the inputs. Meaning, I can play a bad video game just because it's exciting on the rate of play, even if the game design is poor, even if the storyline is terrible, even if the general output that I'm receiving isn't worth my time and effort. But hey, it makes me feel all fuzzy because I'm tapping that cookie a lot. And I kid you not, there is a cookie game. It's an app. You just tap it. It's the only game. There's there's no other part of it. You just tap. By the way, it's not a game. Uh, It breaks all the rules. Board games, on the other hand, can be wonderful. They're slower and that's valuable. They involve people. Uh, It's very hard to get overstimulated playing a board game, and it's really hard to overplay a board game by yourself. It is possible. I'm not going to say it's not, but it's more difficult. (laughs) You're going to find fewer people per capita than if you were to look at video games. Uh, How many people might get stuck gaming alone for any number of reasons? Uh, I love that there's some carryover skills to real life, which we'll talk about here next. And much like questions, these real world games, uh, board games in this case, do have uh, some ability to expose in our hearts the way God has wired us and made us. I'm going to like different board games than maybe my wife or my three kiddos or my friends. Uh, And the reason behind that is really cool. Now, that's true with video games. But again, video games always have these behavioral hooks with them, things like levels and sound effects and haptic feedback in the controller that can make something that isn't well made still excited to me just because it's so engaging and I just don't want to feel bored. And I want that I want that faster than life feedback. 
And so simple tasks can get overstimulating. And we are trying to train ourselves to be okay moving at the pace of your life, waiting for a turn. And that's where the cool part comes in. So uh, I don't, that wasn't like the best sale for this, but that is where my brain goes. And why are we talking analog adventures? Because they're slow. I want something that's still exciting and de designed to be uh, engaging, but it doesn't use cheap tricks to become exciting. It's like reading, right? Like it's good. It's engaging. Certainly it's, uh, anyway, it's good and engaging. And I want to make sure that we're using it well for the right reasons, which brings us to uh, our verse for this is going to be Psalm 139.14. Uh, if you read the whole of 139, it's beautiful. It's talking about why we praise God and how he has called us and knows us and designed us. And that's, I'm going to grab just 14 out of that because it says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Uh, I love that because what we love about making and what we love about playing uh, are going to show how God wired us and some of the things we're designed for. It doesn't mean you don't have to do hard things or learn new skills, but I'm designed differently than Anna. Uh, and the Lord has graced me with Anna for this work. She is so good at concision <laughs> and tight, thoughtful ideas. Uh, and I can see that with all three of my kiddos. I can see that Owen and Henry and Hadley are all wired differently. And God is going to put them in areas where he will use those skills for his glory. Um, I paused there because sometimes we think, well, because I'm good at this, this is the only thing I need to do. We're all called to do the same three things. Love God with all that we are. Love our neighbor as ourselves. And that includes our enemies. And to make disciples, help other people trust and follow Jesus. And the way we're wired will feed into kind of where the Lord puts us to do that well. Uh, so with that in mind, that was a side note, but I felt it was worth saying. Two things, play something, make something. Let's talk about play something. Why board games? I've got five reasons based on research. First, it improves frustration tolerance. This is coming from uh, Regine Galanti, uh, PhD with Scholastic. Frustration tolerance, you lose in board games. Uh, like even just games like Sorry and Monopoly. Maybe not Monopoly. That's a rage-inducing game. But you learn how to handle frustration because they're not made for everyone to win all the time. Many times you lose in even cooperative games like uh, the game uh, Pandemic. We lost a lot playing it during the pandemic. Like we just lose a lot. Uh, so there are games that are intended to be difficult and that's beautiful. So that's the first reason. Second is teach social skills and pro-social behavior. This is coming out of Mumford from 2005. Uh, Pro-social behavior, you learn how to take turns. You learn how to follow rules. You learn how to lose well. Uh, you learn how to win well. You learn how to uh, express your disagreements. These are important uh, skills for our kids. And when I get to talking about specific games, this works down to three and four-year-olds. How do you follow instructions? How do you wait your turn? How do you get the disappointment when someone gets that card you really wanted or that thing you wanted and now you have to delay your gratification because it's not yours right now and you don't just get to throw a tantrum like these are real world skills that aren't built in every form of entertainment board games do have them there still uh they develop basic math skills Romani and siegler 2008 and again uh schultz et al in 2008 um this is Basic math is a part of almost all games. Again, down to three and four, they're going to be including some general ideas of counting and quantities and greater than, less than. Uh, engage critical thinking and develop interpersonal skills. Uh, Hernstein et al., 1986, and fall in the Seattle Times as well. Uh, this idea that you have to both deal with the other people, interpersonal skills now, looking at the face. Uh, yes, there are digital versions of these, but we're specifically talking about playing these in person. I'm going to see your face. We're going to see strategy. I'm going to think big picture. And that ability of uh, cost assessment of a choice, I'm going to do this instead of that, is amazing. Uh, and as long as we're following the rules of a board game, we're going to be forced into some decisions. And that ability to begin thinking critically about what's my best choice and how do I know is a wonderful way to practice in a safe space like a board game. Uh, maintain cognitive function as we age. Yes, this is important. Uh, this is a 2020 study by Deary and Altschul. Alt, excuse me, Altschul. Altschul and Deary. Uh, this has been shown from word games to just the general process of following rules and trying to win. Uh, it keeps our brains active. So you do need something a little bit more difficult than maybe just a Sudoku on your own. Uh, this is how do we engage relationally? How do we build interpersonal time and space with eye contact and real voices and physical contact around a single point? Uh, I am a big fan of board games. Uh, so question first comes is how do we pick the right board game? 
I'm going to break it down into three parts because you can do this. By the end of this podcast, you'll be able to pick board games if you know nothing about them. Yes, you can nerd out hard and go really, really deep. There are people that are way more into board games than I am. Uh, but here's the first thing I would say about board games. You need to keep in mind that board games are like food. Uh, first thing you need to know about board games, you need to be willing much like food, to take a no thank you bite. You need to try new things. Uh, so you're going to go out there and you're going to try a game that may not be your cup of tea, but you're just going to give it a shot. Maybe go to your local board game shop. Maybe try a game that a friend has. You don't have to buy every single game because you're not going to play them dozens of times. It's a great idea to just go try it. Here in Washington State, in Western Washington, there's multiple great board game shops. Uh, there's one in Tacoma. Uh, there's one in uh, Queen Anne, specifically in Seattle area. If you're there, uh, I believe that's called Blue Highway Games. Uh, in Enumclaw, there's the Coal Street Gaming Vault built in an old bank. It's beautiful. By the way, uh, Coal Street and Blue Highway, well worth just a trip to the area. <laughs> if you're ever in General Washington, visit those two board game shops. Try out their games. I think it's like five bucks to rent a table at uh, the Game Vault in Enumclaw, and you just hang out and play games. Uh, it's amazing. So give that a shot. Try something new. Second is Variety is your friend. Uh, excuse me. Your no thank you bite is play something even if you don't want to play it because someone else is into it, you can concede. The no thank you bite is the second piece. Try something new. I kind of join those. Third is leave time for digestion. Uh, you're going to have to read the rules and it can be frustrating to people who are used to just picking up a game and button mashing. I'm going to find out what this game does by hitting A a lot and eventually my character will do different things. I'll hit A once. I'll hit A twice. Can I double jump? Can I slide? Like there's a type of exploration there, but it's just exploration by uh, mistake making. And in this case, it is still mistake making, but it requires reading and then active processing. Again, the critical thinking, just reading the rules. If you want a little pre-digestion, uh, the idea that you might cook a vegetable before you eat it, in the case of a board game, awesome tutorials. I'll give you some uh, both in the show notes, but I'll, I'll list them later. Some phenomenal people have put in a ton of work <laughs> to do this. I've done some tutorial stuff before and uh, these People are top tier, so I'm just going to send you to them. Uh, finally, great games like great meals are best enjoyed with great people. Find games uh, that you can play with others and enjoy just the process of learning and failing. I've gotten to the point now, and I've trained the older two at least, to uh, Owen and Henry to understand that when we play a game, messing it up is part of it. We're going to play that game probably three times before we realize we've been missing a rule. <laughs> Like we're going to play it three different sessions. Usually it's about an hour on a Saturday. We play games really once a week. Uh, so it's not every night. We're not doing this for, you know, days on end. Although if you can, that's awesome. But with our schedule, usually Saturdays uh, when Hadley goes and does some like quiet room time, sometimes mommy takes a nap and then we play a game for an hour. Cool we are going to mess up the rules. And the point is the relationship piece. The point we recognize that we remember that one time we played a game for a month before we even realized we didn't have the rules down right. That's part of the enjoyment and the fun uh, because that is the end game here. We are trying to enjoy ourselves and have fun. So how do then, if that's what we're going to do, if we're going to remember, games are like meals. Uh, they're enjoyed with people. You're going to try new things. You're going to take a no, uh, no thank you bite and you're going to go with other people's uh, ideas. Um, I'm forgetting one. Oh, we're going to leave time for digestion. If we want help with digest digestion, tutorials are helpful. We remember that. Board games are like great meals. Let's just go out and enjoy the experience. Now I want to pick a game. How do I do it? Made an acronym called an antic. The idea here is if you're going to pick the perfect game, you're going to need to know your audience. First, you need to know the age. If you're picking for six to 10 year olds, that's different than if you're picking for 20 to 30 year olds. Uh, how many players? Two players, four players, eight plus. Uh, how much time are you looking to invest here? 30 minutes or less? That's a very specific group of games versus an hour or more, or I'd say an hour to two, and then kind of the two plus. Uh, you're going to find a lot in that 60 to 90 category when you go to games for older kids. And then when it gets to adult games, uh, it's three plus hours and you will have to decide. And if it says three hours, it means three hours. <laughs> you're not going to, you're not going to rush this well. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and then finally, what interests do they have? Uh, or not finally, excuse me. There's two more interests is in like, do they have a specific topic? They like, they like world war two. They like Pokemon. They like, uh, traveling. You'll want to do that. And then is it cooperative or competitive? That will be the final piece. All right. So once you've got your antic, age, number, time, interest, cooperative, competitive. 
Once you've got that down, you now know what you're looking for and you just need to know what's actually out there. So the third thing you're going to do is go look for some great resources. Uh, number one spot I would send you is boardgamegeek.com. Uh, it's in the show notes, but you can just Google it. And there's they can have categories and I'll include the links here because it kind of is awkward to find sometimes. But you can look up games by family games and they'll rank them. This is the number one ranked game. Uh, then they'll have strategy games, party games, best overall. Those are the four categories I would strongly encourage you to check out. When you check them out, just know it'll be a score out of 10. Just know that for some reason, board game people are really rough. I feel like in the video game world, every new game that comes out gets like an 8.5, a 9.5. There's games that still get 10 out of 10s. I've never, ever, ever seen a 10 out of 10 in Board Game Geek. And we're talking the best selling games of all time that have been top of this list for five, six years. It'll be like an 8.4. <laughs> And that's like phenomenal. Some of my favorite games are in the 6.5 to 7.5 range. Uh, there's some like games I like just because they're nostalgic that are fours and fives are not even on the list. Uh, but Board Game Geek is great. Those four categories then rank them within that category. So you can go best family game and it'll look, just look at the top hundred. Look them up at your local board game shop, write down three to five that you want to go check out and see if they've got them. Uh, that's my encouragement if you're checking out board games. Pro tip is... Remember, the scoring situation is difficult, so it can be a little. Huh. I think that thing just landed on my face. Okay. <laughs> so once we have our antic, so once we have our antic down, we know the uh, age, number, time, interest, and whether we want it to be cooperative or competitive. Then we're going to look at what games are even available? I would send you to boardgamegeek.com. You can simply Google it or check the show notes. And there's four categories. I'll put the links there for you to check out. It's family games, strategy, party, and best overall. They basically, you can click family game and it'll show you, here's the top 100 family games as rated by the thousands of users on Board Game Geek. Uh, just know that game uh, board game players are pretty intense. And that means that their rating system is like a really, really, really good game. Like probably one of the best ranked on there is going to be like an 8.5. Uh, and then some of my favorite games are six and a half to seven and a half. And still good games are in the low sixes to the fives uh, that you might just like because it's fun for your family. So don't take this as it's ranked high. Therefore, I need to buy it. It's something for you to check out when you visit one of those board game shops. You can ask the people there or ask if you can play it or just simply uh, rent a table and play if your local game shop allows you to do that. Uh, if you don't know or you want some help with pre-digestion, I mentioned you have a game you want to play now. Uh, you know where you can go. I mentioned tutorials. Two spots I would send you. The first is Watch It Played. This guy's been doing tutorials, I think, for eight years and does an awesome job. Uh, he will give you lovely visuals and very clear instructions, and it goes at a pace you can follow and you can just kind of take it in one cut. It'll be about eight to ten minutes to learn how to play just about any game that's out there. If, however, you're like me and you just want to hear the rules once really fast, you can listen on double time speed. Or you go to uh, the Rules Girl on YouTube as well, and this is three to four minutes. And she also, good visuals, but the rules come really fast. And it just gets you through it once so you kind of know. It's like the cliff notes, but she doesn't cut any corners. She gives you all the rules, but she doesn't belabor the point. She doesn't repeat anything. Uh, it's just going to come through one time really fast. And it's great. So I, I included links uh, for, let's see, for wa Watch It Played, excuse me, I did Wingspan. And for the Rules Girl, I did code names as examples of why their tutorials are really top notch and they deserve all your subscriptions and views and friends knowing about it. Uh, board game reviews can get a little awkward. Sometimes it's an edgier crowd. So I picked two that have historically proven very safe and deliberate. There are other good ones out there. People will reference things like Dice Tower and you can go check those out. But uh, I assumed you'd be watching with your kids and I wanted to make sure these ones, I have yet to find one I wouldn't watch with my kids. So I'll put it that way. I'm not swearing by their... Uh, resources. I just, I have yet to find anything concerning in that. Uh, 
All right, so now we know why board games. Uh, we know that it's like a good meal and how we're gonna kind of set our mind on doing this deliberately. It doesn't have to be every night. It doesn't have to be for six hours a time. You don't have to play Risk or uh, Scythe or any other game, Twilight Imperium, that might take days of your life away. Instead, you're gonna pick a game that fits your family's antics uh, and you're going to use helpful trusted resources, both the tutorial side and something like Board Game Geek to look up great games. All right, so now if I were to just pick a single game from each age, kind of major age group to play, uh, I broke these down for myself based on the age of my kiddos and kind of the middle schoolers that I was using uh, games for in Board Game Club. Here's what I would say. If you had a single game to play for a three to four year old, play Animal to Animal by Haba, H-A-B-A. It's basically Jenga with little wooden animals. It teaches you, you roll a dice, the dice tells you what to do, so now you're following rules, and then it's the hand-eye coordination of setting an animal on another animal, and that there's right and wrong actions to take on your turn. That's all you're building, but it does help introduce this concept that there is a way to play this game. And yeah, you can just free play, just build it up together and that's fine. Hadley and I have played that since she was three. Sometimes we follow the rules, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we just roll the dice because it's fun to roll the dice, and then you just place an animal. Again, the point here is to have fun. It's not to be super persnickety about all the rules. This might be a chance for us as parents to relax a little. So that's three to four. Five to six, Outfoxed has been a great game. It's kind of like Clue, but for little kids. And it's a fox who stole a pie, not as murdering the chicken. So it's thematically appropriate for young kids. Maybe you like your young kids to play Clue, but some people are concerned about the whole murder situation. So uh, five, six, Outfoxed. How do we find it together? It's a cooperative game. You can lose. Um, basically, on certain dice rolls, the fox moves a certain distance. Uh, but a really clever system of the card of who, excuse me, the card of the fox is in a little container. And when you find clues, you put it in. And if it lines up correctly, it means you found the fox. So uh, you'll have to see. That may not be the best explanation, but look it up on one of those tutorials and you'll see the visual. Uh, seven and eight-year-olds, Downforce. It's a Formula One racing game, and it's super fun. It's very easy, uh, but that doesn't mean it's simple. Uh, it has some complexity to it. I've played it with five and six-year-olds. I've played it all the way up to college students and my nieces and nephews, as well as my adult friends. Uh, it's a, actually my last birthday. I got together with a bunch of my former college buddies, and we played into the wee hours of the morning, and uh, I think there were three full rounds of downforce. I will say there's a, uh, shall we say, guessing component to this. There's three different spots on the racetrack as you go uh, that you're going to guess who will win. It might say the word bet, but it's a guess. You're taking an educated guess. Again, critical thinking. Just make sure you know that's there and you can have the conversation with your kids. I literally call it guessing with my kids. I say, you know, we're not going to be betting, but we're going to take a, a, a educated guess based on the cards you got and where people are. Who do you think is going to win? That's how we handle that. You can do it as you'd like. Uh, nine to 10 year olds, Dice Throne is basically combat Yahtzee. Uh, the initial set I would encourage you to get is the Cowboy vs. Samurai because who doesn't want to, it's like that uh, Discovery Channel, I think it was, or History Channel, where they would do like the warrior versus warrior thing. <laughs> so it's that, but it's just Yahtzee. You roll your five dice and you get special abilities and you fight one another. Uh, it is combat, so know that. And there are some mystical elements if you go into the other characters. There's a, uh, there's what would effectively be a Buddhist monk. There's a paladin. Um, there's some scarier characters. There's like a vampire person, not a set that we use, uh, but just know that it's out there. Uh, there's a seraphim. And I told my kids, like, no, those are real things. We're not going to fight a seraphim. <laughs> That's weird. So just know you might choose to skip some of the sets. There's also a Marvel version of it. If you're more comfortable with the Marvel Universe, uh, same rule set, but you can play as Thor. So if that's interesting to you, check that out. That's, but it is highly engaging, a lot of fun, a lot of probability work. If you're a uh, homeschool math folks, uh, you can get into some deep weeds on that depending on the, oh, that's the other thing. Complexity can vary. Uh, and they'll show you on the box if this is like a one out of six or a six out of six on how complex the character is. And I want to say the samurai and the gunslinger are, or the cowboy are two and three out of six. So uh, 11 and 12 year olds love the game Dixit. I've mentioned this game before. Uh, Dixit, D-I-X-I-T, is a game that's like apples to apples with pictures. So you have uh, a number of cards, I believe five cards with pictures on them, and you're going to pick one that represents a phrase. So if I was the person running this round, I would say, it takes one to know one. And then <laughs> everyone would lay down a card face down that they believe lines up with that phrase, and I would pick the winner. Uh, Everyone else then tries to guess 
which card I, oh, excuse me. Ages 11 to 12, the games I pick, uh, or the game I pick is Dixit. It's basically apples to apples with pictures. Uh, every, I, there's a single word or a phrase. I might say hero, and then everyone lays down a card they believe best represents hero, but it's I'm everyone's trying to guess which card is mine out of the stack. And uh, if some people guess it, but not everyone, I get points. So I don't want to be ex super explicit with like hero wearing a cape who's flying through the air with black hair, right? Like that's not the point. It's uh, this ability to work your words and description and know an audience. And it's very difficult and frustrating and super funny. So check it out. Um, and then 13 plus. If I had to pick a single game for you to play at your home with a 13 plus, it would be Wingspan. And I say that because there's a lot of great games and I just want to list 12 of them. But Wingspan is beautiful artwork, super fun facts. There's actually a, a book out on the Wingspan artwork with more details on all the birds. But basically, you're bu building an aviary. Uh, you're building uh, homes for wild birds. And there's forests and there's uh, kind of grasslands and then there's marsh and water. Uh, and you're trying to get birds to come and nest. And the more birds you get, the more eggs they have. And then there's certain parameters like uh, varieties of birds. You have raptors and predators, or do you have songbirds? So, or birds of certain sizes. It's fun. It's complex. It certainly can be highly competitive, but at the end of the day, it's just beautiful. Sometimes my kids just pull the game out and look through the cards because the cards are gorgeous and they have fun facts on them. So, uh, I would say wingspan is one that really draws us towards wonder and, uh, just generally being an impressive and well-made game. So, uh, those are some games I would say to play from three to 13 plus, and there's others I would nerd out on this in a long time, but that's board games. Check them out and play them with your kids. Pick one day a week, an evening a week, pick 30 minutes that you're going to play a game. Uh, do it with your kids or just encourage them to play on your own. When we do those quiet times to find those times when you're just going to unplug for a little bit and Hey, we're going to do something independent where we're not wrestling one another. We're not out being uh, crazy on a trampoline or watching shows or playing video games, playing a board game independently can be a great way to have some fun. Uh, I saw all three of my kids do it at different times in this last week. So maybe read a book, but maybe you just get a board game out and kind of play through. You can do two, two different players by yourself. Uh, and at some point it's going to be relaxing. All right. Now let's talk about making something. If we know how to play something, now we're going to make something. Uh, when we're going to make something, we are using the, uh, design that God gave us to be creative, to look for meaning and to make meaning, not to make our own truth, but to take the truth God has put in us that we're designed for a purpose, that we're sinners saved by grace. All of that is true. And we're drawn to God by his kindness and by his creation. So creating is part of what we do. It's put in us because we're made in the image and likeness of God. How can we create? You can use art as an area for creating. So write uh, poetry, uh, write stories, which I'll get to a way we can do that, but I want to focus specifically on the physical creative act um, of art with drawing, painting, and coloring. So for drawing, Art Hub Kids on YouTube. Use, please, an ad blocker or buy the premium version of YouTube if you're going to be sending your kids on there because ads will pop up and we're not in control of what those are. So find a way to protect your children in that. And when they go on there, uh, you can do this with them, but Art Hub Kids it has free resources. There is a premium version, but uh, there's free resources. You can buy them thematically. There's jack-o'-lanterns that you uh, dr draw a color fold, and then when you pull it open, the jack-o'-lantern's mouth opens. There's intensity that allow for five and six-year-olds to do it, but also for 15 and 16-year-olds to still find something challenging and interesting. And they have all sorts of themes from your favorite characters and games and shows to uh fall and uh, Thanksgiving related and Christmas related. So Art Hub Kids is awesome for drawing lessons and teaching you actually like showing you and then teaching you how to actually learn how to shade and how to create depth and how to uh, make just fun images. So for someone who's not an artist, it's been a, a lifesaver. Uh, painting, certainly painting with watercolor and using tutorials like uh, I talked about with Art Hub Kids, but also painting with one thing we found is a lot of fun is finding a game that has little miniatures and you spray paint them with a primer. I don't do anything fancy. You get a gray primer from uh, Lowe's or Home Depot. It's like $8 for a can, I think, and it lasts for hundreds of these things. Uh, and we then paint the game pieces of a board game that we enjoy. 
So this might be Mice and Mystics. This might be, uh, what's the game they've been doing? Oh, Battletech, little robots that they really enjoy painting. And Hadley does these. She just gets purple out. We have a bunch of purple little mechs now that we use. But whatever the board game is, if it has miniatures, you can prime that thing and you can paint it. Uh, Imperial Assault is a Star Wars game that we've got. You can prime those and paint them. And they can be as accurate as you want. And there's a skill in that. Or you can just paint them because it's fun to paint. So whether you're painting scenery and happy little clouds or miniatures in a game, go ahead and jump in. Uh, there's no wrong way to do it. I will say we use Vallejo Paints. If you need a paint company, that's V-A-L-L-E-J-O. And uh, they do a great job of creating a really easy paint dispenser. There are some paints that are like, why is this so punitive that I'm trying to use your product? And just know you can put them on a paper plate. You can add one drop of water to make it a little more uh, fluid. The viscosity matters, and there are some great tutorials on YouTube on how to paint well if you're interested. Uh, finally, coloring. Pencil lessons, like how do we make shapes? How do we make designs? How do we uh, shade in different ways? Anna, who's the artist of our family, uh, actually found a great one for the kids called Creative Form Drawing by Angela Lord. Uh, does basically like this lesson, we're going to just practice this particular skill and the kids love it. Uh, so if you're interested, again, it's uh, creative form drawing by Angela Lord is the actual pencil lesson. So that's three ways we can draw, we can paint, we can, excuse me, we can draw, we can paint, we can color. Uh, and in this case, you can color in the lines, you can color with a workbook. Hadley just got her first workbook for following lines and making letters and she's in pre-K and we're like, yeah, let's like start this process. That absolutely counts. You can buy a work uh, workbook off of uh, Amazon that works on a skill you're interested in and have that be some independent creative time. That's awesome. Uh, then you can build, build with Legos, either with instructions or without. Build with Duplos if your kid is too young for Legos and it's not safe and they keep putting them in their mouth. Duplos are just bigger. Build with Magnetiles. Uh, they're expensive. There are off brands, but I know that in the last four years we've had Magnetiles. We did three Christmases in a row that we asked for a set of Magnetiles. Uh, we just put them in a giant bin. We found, I think, a Target for $12. We found a giant bin that we just dump them into. Sometimes it's in a closet while the kids are playing with Duplos and then the Duplos go in the closet and we bust out the Magnetiles. Uh, nine, seven, and four is the age of our kids and they still enjoy both. And we've exactly broken one Magnetile in the last four years. And it just broke and Hadley definitely just two foot jumped onto it while it was stacked on other things. <laughs> so if you choose to invest in that, they're not cheap, the actual brand Magnetiles. Uh, but so far, they've been intensely durable. So check it out if you want. You don't need to get any of the fancy ones that are like in the shape of forests and have special textures. But the reason they're cool is kids can free build structures. And then when they build with them, they can create stories with them, which is our next piece. But other things you can build with is just straight up blocks. If you have scrap wood around, uh, there's a great project in sanding that and chopping that and making basically giant Jenga building blocks. You can buy custom blocks for that, but having blocks of some variety that lets your kids just go build and stack. Uh, and Snap Circuits would be the last thing I would add. Snap Circuits is a brand of basically building little electronic circuits. They're very simple sometimes. For 25 bucks, you can buy a set that has you know, 10 examples you can build uh, for building a circuit. How do you complete a circuit? What are the rules of that? And then they get more intense as they go. We really like Snap Circuit. It's been great for our kids. Uh, we're not sponsored or anything. That's just something we use. We found that, again, since Owen was probably five, we got our first set and he's nine and we keep getting new sets. And it's a great birthday gift or Christmas gift for the grandparents to get because they can get a little more expensive and the kids still enjoy them and the parents... Uh, as parents, we're excited to see our kids get them and grandparents still feel like they got them something cool. Uh, so snap circuits can be another option. I mentioned telling stories and that's where I'll take this next one is you've built something and that's great. The building process is fun. Uh, the way the kids build with magnetiles or Duplos when they're free building or with Legos. One of my nephews is incredibly gifted. Uh, actually, several of my nephews are incredibly gifted with just free building Legos. Super cool. Uh, that's wonderful. And once you've built them, you now get to tell stories, build a story. Uh, how can we make a narrative out of just the Lego pieces? Out of the Lego pieces, the little characters, now joined with our Magnetile Town that we built, now built with uh, our Hot Wheels that we've got. This idea of cross-playing is powerful. Kids make meaning out of it, and it's absolutely something that's accessible to a wide range of kids and a great way for kids to play together. Sometimes it's hard for a nine-year-old to play with a four-year-old. 
but this is something they can both do. And yes, kids rage because one kid's going to use Godzilla car to smash the other kid's building. Now we get to talk about treating others the way we want to be treated. It's a teachable moment. Don't don't shy away just because there will be conflict. Uh, understand that that's an important part of building stories together. It can be frustrating when things don't go your way. So make stories, toy kitchen, stuffies. Uh, I mentioned little independent Lego pieces like the characters can be great. Um, and there absolutely is a place for recording this on some kind of a device like your phone. You can use guided access. I included a link to what that is on an iPhone. Guided access locks your kid into an app. Uh, it means they can now record on your phone and not get into the rest of your interwebs. They can then use that. You can upload that to a computer and they can use editing software to make a film. Maybe it's stop animation. Maybe it's just a film that they've made with all of their lovely things like certain family members uh, that I'm related to grew up pretending to be uh, news anchors or like my own family with my four sisters. I have a lot of documented uh, recordings of skits we put on and typically I'm wearing angel wings of some variety. So heads up that and that stuff is out there. <laughs> that stuff is out there but make a story yes you can absolutely write it i mentioned that at the beginning uh to write a narrative and to create one together mad lib style where you fill in the blanks or you create a single line or a single word there's lots of silly ways to build stories uh, that can be a lot of fun and finally i would say bake and cook when we make something we can make something we can eat this time of year amazing options uh, it can be as simple as buy some apples make sauce Applesauce is so simple. Uh, you don't actually have to add anything. You can sweeten it with a little bit of sugar. You can add some cinnamon, but all you really got to do is peel it and not even everyone peels them. If you want a peeler, you can go on, uh, get a Johnny Appleseed peeler from Amazon. It's 30 bucks right now. Do it. It's a great gift for someone this Christmas. <laughs> um, it literally just has a suction cup, sucks onto your table and you just grind the apple through it and it cores it, peels it, slices it. Uh, you can use that to make apple pies. That's another go-to this time of year. Sure, you can do pumpkin pies and other things, but uh, the apple pie we've been making right now, and yes, I right now meaning we have made multiple of this thing. I think Anna's made like four apple pies since the beginning of September. Uh, thank you, Tara, by the way. My sister has hooked us up with a massive box of apples from Eastern Washington. So thanks for that. Uh, but America's Test Kitchen has a book called The Perfect Pie. I got it for Christmas a couple years ago. Do it. Get it for someone for Christmas and make pies part of your just family rhythm that once a month you're going to bake a pie or once a week or every other day. I don't know how often, but they do take some work. It has to be deliberate. It's hard to bake a pie fast, but it's something you get to celebrate. And I've yet to meet someone that turns down a pie as a gift uh, because pies take work and they know how much effort went in. And you're not going to make any money selling these things because fruit is expensive <laughs> and so is flour. So uh, it's a great opportunity to make something enjoy it together and have it be a process and a journey. Uh, and then finally, so you can bake and I would say I make something like applesauce, make something like an apple pie or a pumpkin pie or any other, the hundred pies from that book. Uh, and by the way, the book has all sorts of little cheat codes on how to make your pie crust flaky and delicious and how to make the insides. We make the, um, Dutch apple pie where you soak the apples first, like help them get all amazing and delicious. And we make a dairy-free version. We just adapt it, but you can do however you want. They actually tell you to put it in ice cream <laughs> and you just let the ice cream like soak in for a couple hours. Nom, nom, nom. Uh, but I digress. Radish is a uh, subscription program basically where you can pay monthly to have them send you recipes for cooking and baking. Uh, we've used this and we don't use it every single month, but you can get it for basically 30 bucks. You get a one-off. It can be thematic. Like we want this for, uh, you know, Halloween themed or Thanksgiving themed or ready for Christmas. You can choose just desserts and breakfast stuff, or you can choose all the meals. And it basically comes with some cool little tools. So it comes with an apron, comes with like a special whisk that's kid sized. Uh, and then usually three meals that they can make. And the meal will include like, here's the appetizer. Here's the core thing. Here's the dessert uh, for this meal. Worth taking a shot if you have a budget for that or if you plan it into your budget. Hey, each month we're going to spend 30 bucks on the kid. Kids, one month we're going to buy a game. One month we're going to uh, buy a subscription like a radish thing. One month we're going to do something else, some kind of fun activity. That's one way to do it. Uh, certainly budget in and make sure you've got the time and the space and the priority to participate in these. But uh, know that these are great ways to engage in making things because at the end of the day, Reading instructions and doing fractions with measurements is valuable, uh, or measuring by grams if you're into that, uh, also valuable. 
building and creating story and being collaborative is valuable. Um, and understanding how to take our internal inspirations and make art with them is an important part of how we're made. We are designed to create and uh, we're given a purpose, but in that purpose, we're allowed to celebrate um, God and God's designs. I personally believe this is an act of worship. Uh, when we create well, when we do it because it's an extension of what God's put in us and we're not doing it simply for self-satisfaction and glorification, we're doing it because we can do it. Not because we want to make money, but because it brings joy. And in experiencing that joy, it's something God's given us to enjoy. We glorify God. Uh, and I don't want to oversimplify worship to just, as long as you're out enjoying yourself, you're giving God glory. But there are ways we can do this deliberately. And we can point it out to our kids. That son or daughter, like, God gave you this gift and that's beautiful. Did you enjoy that? When you enjoy that and you're thanking God for the ability to enjoy this thing, you're glorifying God because it's something he gave you to enjoy because he's a good father and he's giving you a good gift. Like, let's tell our kids that. Let's help them make things on purpose because it's beautiful. So uh, what can we do for Analog Adventures in this next week? We can play something and we can make something. Just pick one. We talked about so, so, so much, but pick a game to play. It can be Uno. It can be any game you want. Uh, you can remember that it's like a meal, include people, check out your antic, what's a good fit for your audience, and go to something like Board Game Geek and look at it, and then make something. Make a story, make a piece of art, make something other people can engage in and be a part of, because it's going to be a blast. And remember that when you do all of this, it's because you're fearfully and wonderfully made. That God wired you for it, and uh, you can try something new and realize that even stuff you're not good at can still be fun, because you're learning and growing, and God made you to do those things and to see Him in and through it. Uh, I hope this was encouraging and helpful. Would you, If it was, would you please consider sharing it with others so they can learn and grow from this process as well. And would you join us next week as we continue this conversation about how we can love God and use tech?